Hello guys, I am Paul McWhorter with ExtremePreppers.com and today I'm going to be talking to you about the potential role that hydroponics can play in a prepping or survival type of environment. By way of background, I've been growing hydroponically for about 10 years now. I have an 1800 square foot environmentally controlled greenhouse and I have a variety of hydroponic systems in the greenhouse. I do the NFT, I do the Dutch buckets, I do the ebb and flow. I've tr tried some of the passive uh, hydroponic systems and so I have quite a bit of experience with, uh, with hydroponics. And so I want to kind of share with you today some of the things that I've learned in 10 years of using hydroponics and how hydroponics might play a role in your, uh, in your survival plans. First of all, let me talk about the downsides of hydroponics. First downside is it requires quite a bit of infrastructure. Uh, the hydroponics is based on pumps. If the pump breaks down, you lose your crop because very quickly when a pump goes down, you're not getting that nutrient to the roots the plant wilts and dies very very quickly in the matter of a few hours so you've got to be you've got to be watching it and then also what you've got to be doing is you have got to be uh, making sure that you're maintaining spare parts and so if you're going to think about hydroponics for a survival type of environment you got to think about how many spare parts you're going to need to uh, stockpile <clears throat> so there's a lot of pumps and high-tech equipment that means that you have to have electricity that if the grid goes down the pump doesn't run if the pump doesn't run in a couple of hours you've lost your uh, your crop so you need the grid to be up and you need to be able to depend on uh, the electricity staying up now I run mine on solar and so with solar that gives you a little bit more flexibility in a grid down situation that you would uh, you would be able to keep your pumps uh, pumps running so disadvantages some high-tech infrastructure that you've got to maintain and you've got to ensure that the electricity stays up now there's another downside to hydroponics to to really run hydroponics at peak efficiency you need very pure water now the water where I live has a lot of calcium in it and so if I just use the tap water with that high concentrations of calcium you could also say that it's a very hard water and then I mix the nutrients in the water cannot hold that much chemical or nutrient or mineral material in suspension and it'll combine with the calcium and it'll drop out so I can't get the nutrients that I need in the water because of the calcium. So in my greenhouse I have to purify the water and I do that with a reverse osmosis system. So I, I'm using reverse osmosis water which I'm producing. Now that's not such a big deal for because for a couple hundred dollars you can get a reverse osmosis system but one situation is, is, is that to produce one gallon of reverse osmosis water you have to use three gallons because you've got to be constantly washing and rinsing the uh, the RO membrane. Now this all happens automatically and if you have a RO water system in your house you might not even realize that there's a little uh, a little drainage tube that goes out for the, the rinse water for the filter. So it's not a big deal. It's reliable. It ro it's robust. It makes the water very simply but you're wasting water because for every gallon that you produce of RO water, you're using three gallons to rinse the filter. Now the way I handle this uh, at home to not be a, a complete waste, I generate the RO water for the greenhouse and then that wastewater is still perfectly good water. It's just been run across the filter. I use that to water the, uh, the fruit trees in the arch orchard and to water the, uh, <clears throat> the outdoor uh, garden. So I'm not actually in the end wasting the water, but you've got to kind of plan for that issue with water with, uh, with hydroponics. Now some in the prepping community would say that you're just wasting your time doing hydroponics and the argument would be that when the big one hits you're not going to be able to maintain those spare parts, you're not going to be able to maintain the uh, uh, the electrical infrastructure and you know it's not as robust as growing things in the ground and there's there's some truth to that but I think as preppers the thing that we've got to ask ourselves about is is that what are we really prepping for 
And sometimes what I see in the prepper community is, is that we end up in this echo chamber where as we talk amongst ourselves, it's like, well, this wouldn't work because of this, and this wouldn't work because of this, and this wouldn't work because of this. And it's almost like we, we think ourselves back into the Stone Age, okay? And what I would kind of say is, is that just because things might get that far down as far as bad goes, we're not guaranteed of that. In a lot of survival scenarios, hydroponics would be great. Maybe you are going to have electricity, or maybe you can maintain your solar panels and spare parts. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what some of the upside to uh, to this uh, uh, these hydroponic techniques. And understand, if you look in my greenhouse back here, half the greenhouse I have in uh, containers with organic soil that I just have a drip irrigation system with. So I have sort of have a low-tech half of my green greenhouse. <clears throat> and then I have a high-tech half of my greenhouse. So I'm able to do comparisons, A-B comparisons between the best organic uh, growing techniques versus hydroponics. And I'm kind of like really into the organic uh, gardening, and I really think that organic is probably the best way to grow and the most natural way to grow and the healthiest way to grow. And so my heart <clears throat> is really in the organic gardening. But in this greenhouse, when I do an A-B comparison between my state-of-the-art hydroponic techniques and the sort of best-in-class organic gardening. I mean, when I say best in class, man, in my soil, I am, you know, I am using <clears throat> everything. You know, I'm do using the rock dust. I'm using the, the uh, worm castings. I'm using the best organic fish emulsion uh, fertilizer. I am using the bat guana. I am using everything that you could imagine. The boogie brew tea, uh, 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 tea, uh, compost tea, you name it, and I am doing it. But when I do an A-B comparison between the organics and the hydroponics, hydroponics grows twice as fast. I mean, I you would not believe how fast you can grow things with hydroponics because there's a lot of science behind it, and those nutrient mixes are honed in to the nth degree, and you are just mainlining that perfect nutrient solution over the roots of the plants, and they grow really, really fast with hydroponics. And so if I plant a head of cabbage in the hydroponic system and I plant a head of cabbage in the uh, organic system, <clears throat> hydroponics grows twice as fast. Now I've also done BRICS testing and I'm not seeing any nutritional difference as reflected in a BRICS test between my hydroponics and my organics. And so I was actually a little disappointed in that. I was expecting to do the organics and to see some huge advantage. <clears throat> I'm not seeing that advantage. And so right now, uh, kind of like where I'm coming down, the, the, the hydroponics is very uh, fast growing. Also, it's, it's much less time to grow hydroponically because with this high-tech pumps and computer controlled and, and computer controlling the environment and the flows and the mixing of the chemicals and all of that stuff, man, I spend almost no time in this greenhouse. I would say probably on a typical day, I spend about 10 minutes in there on the hydroponics. I got to pick my produce for that day. And what I do is I stage my planting where basically every day I'm going to have a head of cabbage ready to pick. Every day I'm going to have a bok choy ready to pick. Every day I'm going to have a head of lettuce ready to pick. Every day I'm going to have a broccoli ready to pick. Every day I'm going to have a couple of tomatoes, a couple of cucumbers, a couple of beets. And so I plant these things sequentially so that every day I will be picking fresh produce. I grow about twice as much as I need for my own needs. And so we eat all of our we you know all of our vegetables that we eat come out of the greenhouse and then we have that much again to spare. A lot of times I'll give it away. Sometimes I don't have anybody to give it to and so I'll feed it to the sheep or feed it to the chicken. So we're also kind of supplementing our uh, uh, our feed for the uh, for the animals uh, out of the out of the greenhouse. And so 
I'll probably spend about 10 minutes a day in there. I'll pick the produce that's ready to pick. I'll test the nutrient in the nutrient tank. I'll top off my nutrient tanks. I'll put in a little, uh, you know, uh, the right amount of uh, additive to get the pH right. But boom, it's sort of in and out in 10 minutes. I will say on the weekend, probably Saturday, I'll spend more like an hour in there. And that'll be more cleaning up, getting the uh, seedlings going for the planting for the next week. So typically I'll spend an hour on uh, on Saturday and then on a typical day 10 to 15 minutes and and the thing is that in a prepping scenario you're going to have a lot of different stuff you're going to be trying to manage and handle in a, in a disaster type scenario and so to be able to get this much food with this little work it's a pretty good deal but now I do admit I do admit that there would be scenarios where I would not be able to maintain the infrastructure to keep this going and so like uh, you know there's going to be a point perhaps in a real extreme situation that that last pump is going to go down and I'm not going to be able to keep the hydroponics going because of that again half of the greenhouse is in organic container uh, gardening and with that you could do it without any infrastructure I could just take a a watering pail and go in and water by hand and <clears throat> and maintain that half of the greenhouse I'm um, also as I mentioned I have an organic orchard where I get the fruit uh, my fruit from and then an organic outdoor garden <clears throat> the organic outdoor garden I'm doing uh, what a lot of time on the internet is called in some places it's called uh, back to Eden gardening where it's very very heavily mulched and a lot of mulching and composting going on in other places it's called farming God's way but it's that sort of heavy mulching organic mulching composting uh, gardening technique that I'm using outside what I am finding is <clears throat> where I live in West Texas the, it, the, the intensity of the heat in the summer make it not good for gardening because first of all it's hard to be out working in the garden when it's over a hundred degrees and then a lot of your vegetables just cannot take that level of heat and sun. <clears throat> what I will be trying is I will be trying to do more winter gardening and sort of spring, fall, and winter gardening. And so what I hope to do this winter is start start looking at some of the things that would do well in the in the winter, like growing my cabbages outside. If I grew my cabbages outside in the winter, that would free up space in the greenhouse for some of the other things that I can uh, can grow. And so I'm looking at a variety of things, but for me. In my prepping, um, I really find a place for hydroponics. Yes, it might not work in extreme scenarios, but when it works, it is a lot of food without a whole lot of work. So I'll just show you, step through some of the other hydroponics. This is the nutrient nutrient thin film uh, system here. Basically what you have is you have a, a little stream, a little trickle of nutrients, <clears throat> and the plants stick their roots down in that nutrient and then uh, there's enough air above the roots that uh, you don't get the, the root rot. And so these NFT systems, the things that you can grow in the NFT, <clears throat> they grow great. Some of the things that grow slower, you can end up with a situation that you get a root mass where the root mass dams up the stream and then you start having standing water and that standing water, uh, <clears throat> that standing water will root, uh, rot rot your roots. So the thing that does best in the NFT, the nutrient thin film systems, are very fast growing leafy systems like bok choy, lettuce, cabbage, broccoli, things that grow very quickly. Things that you would want to produce over time like your vine plants do not do very good in, that, in this system. This is another picture of the uh, nutrient uh, film technology and you can see how you sort of are planting things in stages so you're always having some plants mature. These are my Dutch bucket systems where I grow uh, <clears throat> let me get out of your way I'm sorry I was probably covering those things up let me get out of your way and we'll go back and look at those other pictures in case you couldn't see them. <clears throat> so here you can just see the big beautiful bok choy, the lettuce, the kale, <clears throat> the Swiss chard, the broccoli, 
all of these things, the cabbages, all these things doing very, very well in the uh, nutrient uh, uh, film technology system. Here you can see how we're staging the vegetables. Look how bright green they are and how vibrant and healthy. That comes from having those nutrients dialed into exactly what your plants want. The uh, vines and tomatoes, things like tomatoes, cucumbers, those types of things I grow in the Dutch bucket systems, and those work very well in the greenhouse as well. <clears throat> Again, you can see staging things where every day you're going to have some of your to tomatoes getting ripe and ready to pick. Here I'm playing around with growing some squash and zucchini in the nutrient film technology and they do very well in that. They grow incredibly fast and again you've got a stage so I've got one that I'm producing, one that I'm planting and one that's maturing. So sort of having three squash plants at any, <clears throat> at any given time. This is showing some broccoli that I'm growing in the greenhouse hydroponically. Big beautiful heads of broccoli. Uh, also in the Dutch buckets, this is perlite, you can grow root crops. You can see that I'm growing some beets here in the Dutch bucket system. Uh, just showing you a close-up of the, the kind of for size comparison with my hand, just the enormous, big, beautiful uh, heads of lettuce that you can get. Uh, really huge, beautiful beet that I got out of the uh, Dutch bucket system. And then this is a picture of my <clears throat> greenhouse, again, about 1,800 square foot. You can see here that I'm running uh, a wind turbine, and then off to the side I have solar. And so I'm producing <clears throat> the electricity that I need for my home and my greenhouse between the, uh, the turbine and the, uh, the solar panels. This is a uh, picture of some bib, bib lettuce. Again, big, beautiful, perfectly formed heads of lettuce we're able to get in these, uh, <clears throat> these nutrient film uh, systems. This is showing a, scene, a picture of the Dutch buckets, and you can see in these Dutch buckets with the perlite that I'm getting uh, tomatoes and cucumbers going. I actually grew watermelons over here, and I must say the watermelons did really, really well. The thing is the watermelons are slower to grow and slower to mature, and I look at the watermelon more as a luxury item. And so I did it just to show that I could do it, but growing watermelons is not part of the normal normal things that I'm running in the greenhouse. Uh, some beautiful cherry tomatoes, huge head of cabbage. Uh, these are some uh, hatched New Mexico chili peppers that I grew and we use a lot of peppers and so we grow uh, we grow peppers out there. You can do the root crops. These are some carrots that, uh, that come out of the greenhouse. Carrots grow kind of slow and so yeah I can grow them but in the time that it took me to uh, grow this handful of carrots that took up one Dutch bucket and that same amount of time I probably could have grown 50 pounds of tomatoes and so yeah you can grow carrots but they're a little bit slower growing and you're taking up a grow spot that you could grow a vine in and get way way more food production but since I'm growing more than I can eat anyway you know, I'll take a hit in efficiency just to be able to have a little bit, a little bit more variety in what I'm, uh, what I'm growing. These are some cayenne peppers in the Dutch buckets. Uh, some of the really beautiful European cucumbers we're growing, <clears throat> and then again back to the picture where we started. So the question: Does hydroponics have a place in uh, a pre prepping and survival scenario? And I say yes, it has a place. I would not be looking at this solely is the only thing I'm doing because yes there could be scenarios where you might not be able to maintain the infrastructure but man if you can there is no faster way to grow food with minimum effort so whole lot of fib food grown very fast big beautiful plants with very very little effort Yes, I believe there's a place for hydroponics, but no, I would not uh, depend on it so solely for my food production. So, hey, just wanted to kind of show you the project that I'm working on here for hydroponics. Love to hear from you down below here. 
would love to get your comments, would love to uh, see what experience you've had with hydroponics and uh, how well it has worked or not worked for you, and whether you might be interested in trying some of, uh, some of these techniques for your, uh, for your food production. If you like the video, think about giving me a thumbs up, think about subscribing to the channel, would love to hear your comments down below. Again, I am Paul McWhorter from ExtremePreppers.com. Also, think about coming and visiting our website. We will talk to you guys later.